Thank you for that introduction. I'm Professor David Whitcomb. I am a physician scientist who has dedicated his career to understanding complex traits. And today, I have the privilege of talking to you about common risk variants and complex medical disorders. I'd like to start with a hypothetical case of a 33-year-old woman with five years of nondescript ob abdominal pain, and she has new signs of a digestive system inflammatory disease on a CT scan. Now, when she sees this report, she becomes very worried. She begins looking on the internet and trying to find a doctor, and she only has three questions. Why me? Nobody in my neighborhood or my family has ever had anything like this before. What's going to happen to me? And finally, what can I do to change the outcome? Now, these are very obvious and important questions for people with a variety of complex diseases. So she does get a chance to see one of the world's authorities on this disease. And the doctor answers her questions in this way. Why me? I don't know. What's going to happen to me? I'm not sure. What can I do to change my outcome? I don't know. Now, they'll give some other talk about how there's research going on and those types of things, but the answer is really clear. This is a failure of traditional medicine for complex disorders. This was based on the germ theory of disease 100 years ago, and by law, all physicians have to be taught that one factor causes a complex syndrome, and you can use statistics and the scientific method to calculate what that one cause is. Now, we recognize that genetics is important in medicine, but it is vastly underutilized, and there are some reasons for that. Taking a genetic approach, there is a problem called missing hereditability, in which there are some genetic mutations that are called pathogenic that cause a rare Mendelian disorder. However, when the genome was uh, completely sequenced and we begin to find that there were other associations, there were genetic risk factors that were found that were associated with a disease, but they were actually relatively common and they didn't actually cause a disease, they just were associated with it. So what causes these diseases? And that was called the missing hereditability. We addressed this in a paper shown at the bottom of your slide. And what we argue is that the missing hereditability is actually two genes at once that are coming together, or a state occurs in which a very important mutation is silent, but suddenly becomes important and drives disease. Now, what we've learned is that most genetic information is useless in Western medicine, and that's why it's not been adopted. We understand pathogenic variants, and that's the disease genes that will cause things like cystic fibrosis or other major disorders in which there's autosomal dominant or recessive inheritance. However, there's a variety of risk factors that we're not sure what to do with. They're found in GWAS studies, they're common, they're in non-coding parts of the gene, they're not necessary or sufficient to cause the disease, and they may be linked to other things like alcohol use, smoking, or other types of, of uh, risk factors. We also recognize, but are not sure what to do with the fact that they can be part of complex gene-gene interactions or gene-environment interactions they may be similar or different to what we would call a modifier gene, and they're not disease-specific. They're seen in several diseases, uh, but not others. Now, the reason that we're having a problem is that we're taught as physicians to use the gold standard, which is the randomized controlled trial for a complex chronic disease. And what's shown at the top is a disease that has been pulled out of a general population to make a population of patients with a disease. And what you see is it follows sort of a Gaussian, where on the left there are patients that have very mild disease, and on the right there are people with very severe disease. In the middle are patients that sort of have average disease, and those are the ones that are considered to be most homogeneous. And so there are inclusion-exclusion criteria 
to study this disease. Of course, the ones that are suffering the most actually never get studied in these clinical trials. What we find is that very few patients actually respond to a medication, and so very large international studies are done in order to show that there's any efficacy at all. Most medicines that we use have a number needed to treat of four or five and sometimes more, meaning that if you have five patients, only one of them will respond to the medication. Why is that? Well, what we propose is that the etiologies are different even though the symptoms are the same. So the same organ becomes inflamed, but there's a variety of different reasons or combinations of reasons. And if we use a very narrow inclusion-exclusion criteria, we may get a lot of patients with mild disease that aren't going to really make that much difference, and we exclude people with a more severe disease, even though there may be a very obvious target that could help that subset of patients that has that disease. And so the effect of combining everybody by symptom rather than separating them by actual disease mechanism is the limitation between germ theory disease and precision medicine. Now, precision medicine is a new paradigm in contrast to the old paradigm, which is the germ theory of disease, one factor causes everything. And I'd like to use the example of chronic pancreatitis. And what we'll do is we'll go from the old germ theory of disease to the new uh, precision medicine, which really requires a lot of computational biology and other factors. Hereditary pancreatitis is a form of pancreatitis that does run in the family. This is a CAT scan. In the middle is a diseased pancreas and all of the complications of pancreatitis, which is inflammation of the pancreas is shown here. Now, the gene that causes this is shown in the upper right. This is the trypsin gene or PRSS1 in purple, and the inhibitor, SPINK1, is shown in red. People with this mutation, which is the worst mutation we know, have an 80% chance of having an episode of acute pancreatitis sometime in their life. In addition, those who have acute pancreatitis, about half of them progress to chronic pancreatitis, which is complete scarring of the pancreas. The other half don't seem to progress. Those that get pancreat chronic pancreatitis about 40% of them develop pancreatic cancer later in life. And so we see there's a progression of disease of the organ, even though there's only one gene that seems to trigger the whole process. To split this up and to understand that, we developed a disease model. And the disease model helps us understand why the symptoms occur at different periods of time um, and in different concentrations. So, for example, in diabetes, only about 40% develop diabetes and the others don't. Why is that? What we see is that if we look at a progressive model of chronic pancreatitis, we start at the left at people that are at risk because they'll go for 10, 15, 20 years with no symptoms. Then suddenly something will trigger an attack of acute pancreatitis where the pancreas becomes inflamed, that's called the sentinel acute pancreatitis event, or SAPE, and you end up with what looks like early chronic pancreatitis with a lot of inflammation, but in most cases it resolves. Some people start having recurrent episodes over and over again. A subset of patients progress to established and then stage chronic pancreatitis because there's variable effects on the immune system or on the acinar cells that make digestive enzymes, or on the islet cells that make insulin, or on the nerves that cause pain, or on the DNA repair system that leads to cancer. These are completely different cells. There's different risk factors in each cell, and there's different things that drive injury or repair in each of the different cell types. So of course they don't go in parallel. But by organizing in this way, we can put the genetic factors into a injury, inflammation, resolution, regeneration sequence that in some cases goes terribly long, wrong, leading to recurrent acute pancreatitis or chronic pancreatitis. In addition, it allows for the consideration of multiple risk factors. Some are genetic, some are metabolic, some are environmental. We've organized these into a system called TIGER-O, which is an acronym I'll talk about on the next slide. 
what we see is the features of the end stage disease are not surrogates of each other. They're caused by different cell types. And if you take a CAT scan and see how much fibrosis in the pancreas, you cannot predict whether or not they have digestive uh, insufficiency, whether or not they have diabetes, whether or not they have pain, or whether or not they're developing cancer, because each of them have a different combination of factors. And so we have to actually look at each one of those individually. Also, if you try to treat patients at this stage, it's too late. The patient's pancreas is already destroyed. We have to find early signs and symptoms and identify those patients that are progressing because of a specific mechanism. In doing that, we begin to understand that the diagnosis has to be early so that the therapy can be aimed at the patients at the beginning of the disease, not after it's too late. Now, here are the different causes of pancreatitis, and there's a whole list of them. There are toxic metabolic factors like too much alcohol and smoking. Idiopathic used to be a big uh, uh, classification, and now it's small. Genetics is becoming more important. Autoimmune is rare. Recurrent and severe acute pancreatitis, usually caused by gallstone. And obstructive is where there are factors outside the pancreas that are obstructing the duct and causing problems. So what we're beginning to learn is the toxic and the genetic factors are important. So let's look at some of the genetic factors. There's dozens of them, and they are in different mechanisms. Some are autosomal dominant, some are recessive, some are uh, uh, modifier genes, others are risk factors, and some work inside the pancreas and outside the pancreas. So we really have to understand exactly how to organize before we can determine what to do with it. Now, what we recognize is that on the far left, the clinician evaluates the patients and now they're trying to guess what's gonna happen in the outcome. There's a variety of things, recurrent acute pancreatitis, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, where no digestion occurs, atrophy of the pancreas and other things. So at Ariel, we began to look at what are the hidden mechanisms. And the way we did that, we said, okay, what we know is that there are etiologic factors that drive injury. The cells or the acinar cells that make the digestive enzymes and we know that there's a number of digestive enzymes that, when mutated, increase the risk of disease. There's also the duct cell. These are important for squirting the enzymes out of the pancreatic gland and into the intestine. And we're familiar with the cystic fibrosis gene, CFTR, and that is the dominant gene in the duct cell. But there are other ones that are important as well. There's also external factors we have to think about. Is there obstruction? Is there autoimmunity? Has there been trauma? Any of these things can be mild or severe, but amazingly, the pancreas can adapt to it and prevent severe uh, problems from occurring. However, we also see that there are specific responses that occur with different types of injury. And I've listed the type of injury responses in the genes that are known to protect the pancreas, but if there's mutations in the response gene, the injury response fails and damage occurs. And we know that occurs in different cells with different types of outcomes. So we can actually link those things together. So how do we begin thinking about this and determining what actually is linking together? The aerial scientist studied 100 patients in which the etiology was unknown and could not be des described. We picked 10 factors, 10 genes that were most known to be associated and looked at all of the variants that kept popping up in deep sequencing. And what we found was there was a number of pathogenic variants that were overexpressed compared to what we would see in, based on the minor allele frequency. And then we looked to see if they were occurring together in any particular type of pattern. What we found is that there was a connection between different types of genetic variants and they had a general pattern where there was uh, injury generation, injury response, which normally compensates for the injury. But if you have a combination of extra injury and failed response, you get a disease. How we looked at this is by mapping out all the genetic variants. And you'll see at the top is the acinar cells and on the left, the duct cells where the, the injury is generated 
And on the right, you see the defense mechanisms, injury or impair, and at the bottom, a gene that is a youth uh, ubiquitin ligase that cleans up uh, secretory proteins and other proteins that are misfolded or are in the wrong part of the cell, or in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus where they should be in a secretory pathway. And what we see is that there is a tight link between genes that are in a secretory pathway and we know are misfolded or don't work properly and the, uh, the proteins uh, clearance, clearance medicine mechanism. And so those two tend to be linked together. In addition, we see that the duct cell, if there are different types of CFTR variants that are not pathogenic, they seem to cluster with a important gene called GGT1, which is an antioxidant that occurs in the duct cells that protects the pancreas and the duct cells from injury. And it also is linked with the UBR1, so that if you have a combination of these factors, the cells fail and you end up developing chronic pancreatitis. So now we're beginning to understand how these things work together. So let's consider the polygenic risk score. How do you put multiple SNPs together to empower precision medicine? Well, there's a lot of problems with this, and it has been very difficult for it to gain traction. Part of the reason is that these variants are found by association studies where you take all the cases and all the controls, not looking at mechanism, but at disease symptoms. And it could even include things like uh, ICD-10 codes or other things in order to classify these patients, even though they internally are very different. These are common variants with low to moderate effect size, so they're not disease-causing by themselves. These variants uh, are used to, to make a polygenic risk score, which I'll talk about on the next slide. There's a number of challenges because they're distinct from the tag SNPs. These are used as proxies for a whole variety of SNPs in a certain location for identifying genetic risk. And the tag SNPs are often part of very large haplotypes, which have multiple functional variants. And so it can become difficult to understand exactly what each variant does and how to untangle these things. There's also major penalties for multiple testing of huge numbers of SNPs, false discovery. There are lack of a deep coverage of certain genes because uh, the uncommon variants are not there. The structural variants are often underrepresented. Uh, the effect size of the variants are also hard to calculate because it depends on the comparison group. It depends on the ancestry of the patient being evaluated and the types of cases that can be accessed and other selection bias. And so these effect sizes are highly uh, relevant to uh, the context. Also, comparison between clinical studies is very difficult as people will use different uh, SNP arrays and other uh, features where we've tried to use imputation, but there's many, many limitations. And the other big problem is phenotyping. It's incomplete, it's inaccurate, and imprecise. And so these case control studies have some inherent problems. The polygenic risk scores also have problems in themselves. It is a list of variants associated with the disease, but the score is based on the sum of the variants. It doesn't really give you a lot of insight. Um, these are adjusted by statistical odds ratios or the log of the odds ratios to sort of weight these a little bit to help improve the, uh, the accuracy. They have been shown to be quite useful for populations, but they're less useful for individuals. And for precision medicine, it's the individual we're trying to understand. So there's an overlap of the cases of controls based on a polygenic risk score. Again, these scores look at the relative risk rather than the absolute risk, and they really don't understand the complex relationship between SNPs that our scientists at Ariel are teasing out, as I showed on one of the previous slides. It does not provide significant insight into disease mechanism. It's just an association, and it doesn't guide you toward the appropriate therapy. 
I'm going to show you an example that we have used from my University of Pittsburgh study on the pancreatitis group. And the question was, why do some people get diabetes and others don't? And the thought was, well, maybe they have type 2 genetic mutations that are giving them the disease. So what we did is we took people with pancreatitis but without diabetes and patients with chronic pancreatitis and diabetes calculated their polygenic risk score. And in the middle, we looked at the polygenic risk score of a comparison population that only had type 2 diabetes without pancreatitis. And what we found was the patients that were with chronic pancreatitis and no diabetes were highly different than those with type 2 diabetes, but the patient with chronic pancreatitis and diabetes had risk scores that were almost identical to people with type 2 diabetes without chronic pancreatitis. So this clearly shows that if you have type 2 diabetes risk and pancreatitis, you're likely to get diabetes. However, how do you apply this to an individual patient? What you see when you look at these contour plots is the, that on a population basis, there's a big difference between the weighted scores of patients with and without diabetes. But an individual patient with a score of 70, you have no idea if they're going to get diabetes or not. There's such a huge overlap that it's very difficult to apply this to an individual patient. Now, at Ariel, we're very excited about using SNP panels. What we have done is that we have tried to focus on the specialized cells and the biology of the organs and the systems associated with the signs and symptoms of disease. We link the physician's questions, which are very specific, with actionable data and clinical decision support. The genotyping that we use depends on how much you want to spend. We can do whole genome sequencing, well, exome sequencing, a custom sequence panel, which we're very excited about uh, because it provides a lot of opportunities for difficult to evaluate regions, and then a modified SNP chip, which has incredible potential for screening for these disease and classifying patients, and it has a, a, a low affordable cost. So there's an integration of the effects of each gene and summarized and quantified and they're linked to the cells in which is expressed, the mechanistic role within the cell, and how it interplays with biology and pathogenesis. Modeling is then used to combine the uh, genetic altering mechanisms, the environment, and other knowledges. We bring biomarkers in to determine how active the disease is and how far progressed it is. And the information is backed into models that then tell uh, what is going to happen under the circumstances that's unique to that specific patient. Expert systems are needed to take the knowledge of biology and medicine and put them together to classify a patient. It's used to predict the biomarkers that are needed to, to determine exactly what's wrong or other specialized tests and to understand the treatment options that uh, are necessary to uh, come up with the best management plan. There's a number of limitations, though, using a SNP chip. Uh, one of them is that there's only a subset of possible genetic variant, uh, variants that can be used. There are many that have not been discovered yet or not included. Uh, the model is not, therefore, 100 percent accurate. It can just guide on subpopulations of patients with uh, similar signs and symptoms and what is the uh, likelihood they have one disease versus another. And it does prevent an opportunity, though, uh, to use polygenic risk scores with a lot of additional information as a clinical support tool, not only for pancreatitis, but for a variety of other complex chronic diseases, such as diabetes, hyperlipidemia, liver diseases, uh, digestive uh, problems that we're studying on, and even COVID-19, which we are helping to understand as well. So how does what we're doing at Ariel differ than a classic genetic report. Well, if a physician sees a patient and says, they, I think they might have cystic fibrosis, they'll look at the signs and symptoms, they'll look at the risk factors such as family history, their ancestry, and germline genetics, looking for pathogenic disease-causing uh, genes, and then they write a report. But that's only about 3 to 5% of the patients with the same signs and symptoms. 
What's really needed is to expand the genetic report and to transform it into a clinical decision support so that the physician knows in every patient what's wrong and what to do about it. In order to do that, there's additional acquired risks that are important to understand. In addition to that, the Mendelian and the complex genetics have to be considered so that there's additional risk factors that are reported. Then the patient's state has to be brought in. How old are they? What's their sex? What are their comorbidities? What other factors they have? What biomarkers are there of disease? Is it active or not? Are there imaging findings? What laboratories are abnormal? Is there pathology? That information is put into a expert system that helps discern the mechanism of disease. What kind of additional test will make the correct diagnosis of the disorder rather than the end stage disease? How far along is the patient in the disease progression? How much activity is there? What is the trajectory? What are the other comorbidities that are likely to occur? And what kind of a treatment can you use and are there risk or benefits of using one treatment or the other? Those pieces of information then provide clinical decision support with a follow-up to understand patients that do or do not respond to the recommended treatment and to continually learn a better way to provide precision information to each and every patient. There's a 10 things that have been proposed that have to be done in order to achieve precision medicine. These have been listed and published uh, a number of years ago with the beginning of the precision medicine um, uh, uh, interest. And all of these have to be brought together in some way. At Ariel, what we recognized is both the physician and the patient has the key tools in order to do precision medicine. And that's a smartphone where an e-prescription can be sent to a patient. They can be contacted at their home. All the exchange can be done by the phone, by internet, and by mail. And a complete report that actually provides direction for the physician can come back to them as well. Thank you for your attention. If there's any questions, I'm happy to explain them to you and help you understand that aerial precision medicine is actually both a research and a clinical genomics health information technology company so that patients in research studies can have clinical genetic uh, test results to come back so they can be properly classified and followed for future understanding of disease. Thank you.